But let's move on now to a story about independent Senator Lydia Thorpe, who went on a wild rant criticising Prime Minister Anthony Albanese, which was so unhinged and expletive-ridden that the ABC had to cut the feed. The referendum is an act of genocide against my people and the Prime Minister knows exactly what he's doing. He wants the f***ing fascists to come out and get me. Now, we muted out some of the more offensive words, but viewers on the ABC got the entire raw exchange. And it all related to a disturbing threat the senator had received from an actual Nazi figure which is being treated very seriously by police. But to suggest that Anthony Albanese had sent people after Thorpe to silence her is just crazy stuff. No matter your thoughts on the referendum or how he is handling it, Albanese is a decent person who clearly cares about this country and he would never team up with extremists like that. So why did the ABC take Thorpe live, knowing she has a track record of saying the most extraordinarily unhinged things? And it even got worse. In the ABC's news coverage of this incident, they didn't replay the crazy comments directed at Albanese. Have a listen to how they nuanced the story. So I'm not hiding. For the next nine days, you're going to hear from me and you are going to see me and I am not scared. And I won't stop. And I'm not scared. So come at me. If you listen carefully, they completely cut out the grabs where Thorpe was targeting Albanese. Even though Thorpe was clearly calling out Albanese, the ABC was refusing to say that. Now, this is really, really bad stuff. Have a listen. Uh, where she levelled accusations at both the AFP and uh, Victoria Police as well as the federal government for failing to protect her uh, from the, racial, the threats of racial violence and abuse. That is intentionally deceptive. That isn't a mistake. That is a reporter changing the reality of what happened to control the narrative of the story. Thorpe's allegations against Albanese or claims that the referendum is genocide should be condemned by everyone. The ABC shouldn't be massaging her message to make it seem normal. Darren, um, it, was, it was an extraordinary um, press conference by Lydia. I can see why they took it live. It was a big story. She had this threat. Uh, but to, the way that they handled it, obviously they had to cut the feed, probably the right call uh, in a fast-paced newsroom. You have to make a call. But then to, to change the news coverage so that Albanese's not even mentioned in that story, I thought that was questionable from an ethical point of view. Yeah, I think this just goes back to the, the you know a point that we've, we've made a few times now, which is that the kind of failures are actually gained by partisan support and um, has just resulted in recriminations and division and opened up old wounds and you know the way in which the Yes campaign has prosecuted its case. Um, I just left people feeling very confused about what, what the correct way forward is. And, um, and it's just also, as you've said as well, is actually cannibalising the Yes campaign. And I think ultimately as well, it just distracts from what really should be the debate, which is how to improve the lives of Indigenous people, communities, um, the education that they have access to, their life expectancy, their quality of life and things like that. And that should be the, the debate that everybody's having at the moment, not this kind of ugly incident that was uh, portrayed in the way it was. Yeah, I mean, it, it was very odd that Albanese was targeted in that way. And uh, no matter what you think of him, he's clearly not doing that. And I, I do think that's the role of, of a reporter of the ABC to say, that's clearly nonsense. I mean, what's the insinuation that he's, he's calling these people up, he's sending fascists? Yeah. It, it, it's crazy, lunatic stuff. You want to talk about conspiracy theories? It's, 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 it's absurd. It's absurd, but no one does a press conference better. No one does a press <laughs> conference better than Lydia Thorpe. She's got the sunnies on. She's got people in the background. She's heckling members of the public that are walking past. It's the show, it's the circus, and uh, long may it continue. One thing I would say is, she says I'm not going anywhere. She says I'm going to be very loud in the next couple of weeks, in the next week of the debate. That's interesting to me because I think there are a lot of, uh, you know, let, let's say like, radical left voters out there who are very for the voice because they want Indigenous people to get a better say in politics. OK, but if Lydia Thorpe's out there saying don't vote for the voice, this is the white man's, uh, you know, uh, you know, the white man's... Uh, genocide. Yeah, yeah, just yeah. like, this is the white man's voice, uh, it doesn't help our community, don't vote for it. That is going to be a, a, 
a fair chunk of uh, yes support is going to be siphoned off by Lydia Thorpe getting out and saying that. So if she's as loud as she promises to be, and I do not doubt that she will be loud, if there's one adjective I would describe her, that's it. She, uh, this could be a referendum, you know, maybe not change it, but I think that could be a big swing for about 4 or 5% of the vote. Yeah, and, and obviously she's feeling under pressure mm. uh, because, you know, th she is in this unique position uh, where she is advocating for a no voice, but mainly because she wants um, a much tougher version. She wants treaties. She doesn't mm. want that official agreement. Uh, but I, I think the way that we have to cover that from a news point of view is to understand that that is quite an extremist proposition and, as you said, almost it's a bit of a distraction. Yeah, there's almost no focus on the central issue here with the referendum yep. and, and where's the detail on how... The voice I feel voice. like she doesn't even care, to be honest, when you see yeah. stunts like that. I, I don't think she honestly thinks Albanese is sending fascists against her. Yeah. There'd that, have to be something very wrong. And then, so what is it? You're giving a press conference to a complete stunt. But look, let's move on. We've given it, <laughs> we've given it too much airtime now. I want to go to our, my favourite uh, section, Stories of the Week. What, what have you got for us, Darren? OK, so a little bit off, off topic um, from what we've been discussing tonight. But this is a story about um, the Australian soccer coach and... Postagoglu, I haven't murdered the pronunciation there, um, who manages Tottenham, which is a Premier League club, uh, against all of the naysayers and many, many critics out there. There was a bit of snobbery in English soccer league about him coming over an Australian. Lots of people pointing out they'd never um, actually managed a, a, a club in one of the top um, elite leagues, five uh, elite soccer leagues in Europe. Two, two months into the season, uh, Tottenham are unbeaten, second in the, uh, the table. They're scoring great goals. They're really entertaining. Um, he's his top signing over the transfer um, acquisition over the summer. James Madison has just been uh, nominated Player of the Month, and the news story here is that um, Ange has just been nominated potentially for the second consecutive month in the Premier League Manager of the Month. So, um, what a brilliant Australian success story! Absolutely, I mean, just, take that naysayers. Yeah, I mean, he walked into a divided, toxic dressing room. He galvanised all of these very young, talented players, which is a very hard thing to do. A lot of older coaches don't connect with young players these days. I and feel like this say, is a plot to Ted Lasso. <laughs> in, in all, well, there were a lot of comparisons in, in a kind of a, uh, a mocking way of Ted Lasso. But right. he's defied the naysayers, and I think it's a, it's a great Australian success story. Well, a good coach is a good coach, right? Yeah, and long may it continue. <laughs> James, what have you got for uh, us? Well, staying on sports, uh, AFL legend Dermot Burton joined uh, SEN Radio today and told a pretty funny story about a government minister. He walked up and pushed to the front of the queue and he was really well dressed. Mm. And he said, you have, this is verbatim, you have to have a photo with me. <laughs> and I said, I'm sorry, sir, I don't have to have a photo with you, but I can have a photo with you if you stay in line. <laughs> and he said, no, I'm not lining up. You have to have a photo with me. Oh, I'm the Minister for Trade and Tourism. Oh. And I said, oh, well, I'm, I'm sorry, there's other people in, in the line here first and he's... His wife jumped in and said, he is, he's the Minister for Trade and Tourism, and it was Don Farrell. And I said, well, good luck to you, mate. Um, yeah, that's, that's not how it normally works. So he was the only pox. There's certain, there's certain people in the world that can pull the do you know who I am. I'd say Tom Cruise, I'd say Brad Pitt, Ange Postacoglu. The Minister for Trade and Tourism, no, you can't. You, you, no one knows who you are. But the, the people like Tom Cruise would never do that. <laughs> people who are, are truly famous yeah. want to bring you in for your thoughts on this. But it's the equivalent of saying, do you know who I am? It's, yeah. it's yeah. the most cringe kind of comment that someone who's pseudo-famous, you know, particularly yeah. politically famous, it's absurd. Very un-Australian. Very well. un-Australian. I, I love the response as well, putting him back in his place. <laughs> Well said. Darren Davidson, James Bolt, thank you so much for joining me.